the Russian population was not growing as fast as the population of Asian republics. And I think it was a very cynical policy of uh, Moscow leaders. So I think there was a lot of resentment uh, amongst the conscripts. They didn't really believe in this war. For many in combat, this sense of detachment will soon change. For most of the guys, they were more or less indifferent until they experienced personal casualties among their friends or they were wounded. Then, by blood, they were committed to this vicious circle of cannon fodder. Once you lose your buddies, peers, with whom you had a personal uh, experience sharing your life, uh, your service, then you just start from there. Then for you, it's like the whole damn thing personifies in the faces of those who, were peri who perished. And re the revenge is the word. That's it. And for them, it's, there is no difficulties, no doubts. It's as simple as that. They killed my body. Now you watch me. I think the fear element had grown. I think also the fear element had grown with the Soviets because word did come back of what happened. And if you look at the Soviet propaganda, which a lot of it was, was probably not that far off the mark, that if you got captured, they would skin you alive. I and mean, I always remember this being one particular element, that they would skin you alive. And it, it did happen. By 1985, the Soviet air campaign, led by the Hind, has added to a civilian death toll of nearly half a million people. One out of three Afghans are soon refugees. Atrocity gives way to atrocity. It was not a very nice war, and, you know, I talked a great deal with both Soviet prisoners and Afghans themselves, and I usually carried a copy of the Geneva Conventions, a cartoon, book in my pocket to try and explain to the Afghans that, you know, they, they should not kill prisoners. This was not part of the game. And most Afghans really couldn't see the logic in this. They said, well, you know, if we keep prisoners, we have to feed them, and they're bombing us, they're killing us, so why should we keep them alive? You know, which, you know, was, was their point of view, and probably from their point of view also, you know, justified if they'd lost uh, loved ones. just fortified the views of those who spent some time there. It, it gave them ugly justification for atrocities on our side. So for us, it was very simple. When we dealt with the POWs, we would have only very limited options. He cooperates with us. If he doesn't want, he would be wasted on the spot. That's it. Nothing fancy, no slicing, no knifing, anything like that. With each passing month, combat in Afghanistan turns more savage. By 1986, even the children of the Mujahideen are willing to sacrifice themselves if it means costing the Russians one more chopper. Unlike the Hind, most Soviet helicopters fly without heavy armor and bulletproof glass. One of our uh, medevac helicopters was shot down by a teenager. And after he was killed, it turned out that he was no elder than probably 13 or 12 years old. When he shot the pilot, a bullet struck him right between his eyes from uh, probably around two to 250 yards. And he was and he, he had enough guts to shoot from such a close range and to take all. Uh, and pro I'm sure he had a pretty understanding of what would happen with him, and he took the risks. So we developed the feeling of just respect to professionalism and to the other side.
1986 marks a turning point in a war already going badly for the Red Army. Early in the year, shoulder-held, heat-seeking missiles find their way into Mujahideen hands. Called Stingers, these American-made weapons are funneled to the war zone through Pakistan, compliments of the CIA. And once you locked in, the Stinger gave a sound that you are locked in. And, and then you just release the rocket, and then you, you see a white smoke, like a rope, going all the way. And then, uh, then you see a fireball. Then all the Mujahideen, they become very happy. When they shot one, they say all oh, that the God is great, is sound, and then they fire all their, all their lights weapon into the air, is celebrating it. A design characteristic of all of the mill helicopters, but particularly on the hind, is the, the inline drivetrain. The TV3117 Victor engine has a particle separator on the front, straight through drive that passes through the exhaust into the main transmission, which leads us to a vulnerability of the hind. The hot gases discharge directly out of the side on both sides of the aircraft, ideal targets for heat-seeking missiles. Uh, this is the Stinger missile system. What we have is the IFF antenna, and it sends out a signal to the aircraft, and it comes back to here, and we can tell whether the aircraft was friendly or a foe. What you have here is the, the sight reticle that he's looking through. Uh, he uses this for, for sighting on the aircraft, and depending on what type of aircraft it is, he has uh, two or three different spots that he can place this in. Um, this is the grip stock, which is separable from the actual launch tube. This is the, the whole thing here is a launch tube, which is the actual Stinger missile, and the grip stock is separable. Um, this is a BCU, which is a battery that actually powers the unit. And with that end, we have about 40, 45 to 47 seconds to actually engage aircraft before the BC runs out of life. The General Dynamics Stinger weighs just 35 pounds, travels twice the speed of sound, and can reach aircraft flying as high as three miles away. Some in the CIA think the Afghans too primitive to handle the weapon. The assessment is far off base. The guerrillas are quick learners and possess a patient determination that proves deadly to Soviet air crews. One resistance commander exclaims, there are only two things we Afghans need, the Koran and more stingers. Well, you see, the uh, basis for 10 years of war didn't change, and uh, we used one and the same basis. So, however, you would uh, change the routes uh, leading out of the base and back to the base, the directions were still the same. Uh, so, Mujahids built up a fortified positions in the mountains on the general directions of our approach to the airfields and uh, our routes leaving the airfields. And especially when they got stingers, uh, they had people literally sitting with stingers, and if not in a day, then in a month, at this particular point, uh, an aircraft would appear and would be shot at. The most dangerous time was around 1986. We lost a third of our men and a half of all our helicopters. Most of the guys lost were in MI-8s, because they are most vulnerable during landings and takeoffs in enemy territory. By 1987, flare dispensers have been added to most Soviet helicopters decoys to any heat-seeking missiles that may lie below. Airplanes, too, utilize the new tool. Despite this, in 1987 alone, more than 200 Soviet aircraft fall prey to the American-made weapon. On, almost on a daily basis, 